Growth chart assessment is a fundamental diagnostic tool in terms of evaluation of any child with growth failure. Unfortunately, the practice of growth, on, growth chart interpretation is not followed very rigorously. Otherwise, if growth charts are properly assessed in that situation, in majority of cases, it is one of the most effective tools to decide about which investigation to work up and how to go forward in a child with pediatric endocrine disorders. Through these presentations, basically we'll look into how a single piece of paper as growth chart could be the most important tool in our armamentarium. And for that, we need to understand what really we need to look at in the growth chart. So there are three things that we have to look at. First of all is the height and weight percentile, which gives us the information about the absolute status of that individual in comparison to a given population. Second is about parental expectation, which really places that particular individual with regards to the family. And finally, and most importantly, is the height and weight age. And I'll emphasize that this would be the most important aspect of this discussion, because that really gives us the effect of nutritional causes. So when we talk about growth failure in terms of uh, evaluation perspective, typically we talk about growth failure being either nutritional in which there is issue about either less nutrition, infection, absorption issues like celiac disease, renal tubular acidosis, or endocrine causes in which nutrition is enough, but the hormones are not there to really cause growth, like growth hormone deficiency, hypothyroidism, Turner syndrome, pseudohypoparathyroidism. The basic difference between the nutritional causes and the endocrine causes is that in the nutritional causes of growth retardation, it is the weight which is predominantly affected, while height is secondarily affected. So these, these individuals will have a weight age which is significantly lower as compared to the height age, while for endocrine causes, the weight and height age would really be commensurate in most situations. So if you look at these three basic things in a growth chart, one would be able to really interpret it in a proper fashion and decide about further investigation and workup. I would not go into debate about which growth charts to use. Ideally, a growth chart which is suited to an individual population should be used. But if we really correct it from a familial effect, in that perspective, it would not make a huge difference from an individual. And we can see how that will apply to our examples. So coming back to this example of this 12 year old girl whose height is 135 centimeters and weight is 28 kgs. We see that this girl is short as compared to the standard reference of CDC. But the next step which logically comes to our mind is whether she's really short for her family or not. And for that we know the father's height is 164 centimeters and mother's height is 151 centimeters. And if we calculate the mid parental height, it comes at around 151 centimeters. And the reference range for standard deviation would be 6 centimeters. So the range for this girl would be between 145 to 157 centimeters. And we draw a line from the lower limit of the range and the upper limit of the range to get the growth chart for this particular family. So what we see is that although this girl is short as compared to the CDC reference, when we correct it for the family, she becomes in the normal range. So that's why whatever chart we use, we should use some chart and correct it for parental expectation to get the appropriate result. Now the third question was whether it, how was the weight age and the height age of this child. And what we can see is that for that, we have to understand what really height age and weight age is. So height age is the age at which the current height becomes the 50th centile. And to identify that, we have to draw a line from the current percentile to the point where it meets the 50th percentile line and draw a perpendicular from there and where it meets in the x-axis, that is the height age. So this girl as 12 years of age has a height age of nine and a half years. And similarly, if you look at the weight age, it comes to be eight and a half years. So this girl has a familial short stature with a nutritional component. Generally, for nutrition to be a predominant driving force for the cause of growth failure, one would expect a difference of at least two years between height age and weight age. 
So we don't do anything in this girl, we just follow up. And on follow up after six months, we find that this child has gained 3.5 centimeters in six months, which is seven centimeters per year, which is absolutely normal. So how do we interpret on the chart? This is the growth velocity chart. We use the point, which is the midpoint between the two measures. So when we talk about 12 and 12 and a half years, it becomes 12.25 uh, years. And when we put the dot, for that particular growth velocity is pretty much falls at the 50th percentile line. So this child is short for the population, normal for the family, growing normally, nothing to worry, this is a classical case of familial short stage. What about this boy? 13 year old boy, his height is 135 centimeters, which is definitely short. And the weight, if you look at it, is also short. The yellow dot indicates the height as compared to the bone age, which is 11 years. Now this child from the absolute perspective is both short and lean compared to the CDC population. If we look at his height age and weight age, the height age is nine and a half years and weight age is also nine and a half years. So he's three and a half years behind as far as growth is concerned. And if we correct it for the mid parental expectation, which father's height is 169, mother's is 156, happens to be around 169, he is definitely short as compared to the family as well. So do you think this child really requires extensive evaluation? And um, often in this situation, people will be worked up for routine causes with CBC, SGPT, creatinine, thyroid, celiac disease, and everything is normal. Then they will be advised a growth hormone stimulation test. So the million dollar question out here is that this child really has growth hormone deficiency. I would say in a child who presents around 13 years of age with slightly delayed bone age, mild growth failure, no pubertal development, 99 out of 100 of these children would actually have constitutional delay of puberty and growth and not growth hormone deficiency. One person case could be growth hormone deficiency, but if we do not do a primed growth hormone stimulation test, we may falsely diagnose them as growth hormone deficiency because unless they are exposed to testosterone, they would not really produce that much amount of growth hormone. So in this perspective, the most important thing, particularly if testicular volume is less than 4 ml, is to just observe, wait and watch. And as happened in this situation, the child continued to grow for a longer time and was able to achieve the mid-parental expectation. And therefore, this was a classical case of constitutional delay of puberty and growth. So we have seen two clear cases in which no particular investigation was required when we actually looked at the, bone, uh, the growth chart in a more appropriate fashion. Now coming on to this 15-month-old girl who was an infant of diabetic mother born large at birth and the pediatricians were tracking continuously about the growth and found that this child was actually faltering and had crossed four percentile lines between birth and 15 months of life, became very concerned, did an evaluation, workup showed everything else was normal, there was mild metabolic acidosis, a pH of around 7.24, a base excess of minus 7, labeled as renal tubular acidosis and referred for evaluation. Now, do you think this girl is really short, requiring pathological causes like RTA? Now, the most important question which comes to our mind is, what is the parental expectation? And we see that her parents are short. So, this child was destined to be short, but was born large because of environment. Size at birth is determined largely by environmental factors like placental factors while that at final height is largely determined by genetics and the switch between environment to genetics takes place by around two years of life. So in the first two years of life you can have a parental expectation appropriate catch down growth as in this setting or a catch up growth in a corollary situation of a tall lady with pregnancy induced hypertension along with growth failure because of a SGA child. So crossing of lines in the first two years of life, if it is commensurate with the parental channel, is not an issue of concern. This is a normal cash down growth. No need to do unnecessary investigation. What about this child? 10 year old girl, height is here and weight is here. 
Now, even if you don't calculate the height age, weight age, you just have a look at the growth chart, you would be able to see that in this girl, it is the weight which is predominantly affected. And we have to be really concerned about nutritional causes of growth retardation, be it celiac disease, renal tubular acidosis, tuberculosis, infections, and all those sorts. To be more precise, what we see is that her height age is 7 years and weight age is around 4 years. So her weight stopped growing at around 4 and then the height was affected. It would be a waste of money doing IGF-1, cortisol, growth hormone in this child. All you need to do is basic evaluation and we found that this child actually had celiac disease with very high level of tissue transglutaminase antibodies. What about this boy? 8 year old boy, height is 100 centimeters and weight is 18 kgs. It doesn't require any analysis to just have a quick look at the growth chart to see that this is clearly not nutritional. It's the height which is predominantly affected. The height age is around three and a half years while weight age is five years. So this is a short and plump child, waste of money to do a blood gas, electrolytes, tuberculosis workup, celiac disease workup, classical case of an endocrine cause of growth retardation, most likely hypothyroidism slash growth hormone deficiency. And when the workup was done, it confirmed the diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. Now coming on to the other problem which we see very often in terms of early development, particularly with regards to precocious puberty, this was a six-year-old girl who had thilaki and was very tall for age. Parents were very happy. Went to a gynecologist. They said these things happen early, nothing to worry. No need to be very concerned about that at the moment. And the child was reassured. But thankfully, the child came to us for evaluation. And the first thing we looked at was what is her bone age? And we found that bone age was alarmingly at 11 years. So this girl at 6 years of age is tall. Height is around 7 years. Weight is around 7 years. But remember that her bones are already 11 years. So she has lost 4 years of growth. This is not a simple case of early slowly progressive puberty. It is a progressive form of precocious puberty. And if we do not treat, this girl is going to land up really short. And therefore requires treatment in this perspective. So in this regards, bone age becomes extremely important. Coming on to the entirely different paradigm of overweight and obesity, which is the increasing problem that we are encountering in clinical practice. This is a 12 year old boy who presented with the height of 160 centimeters and weight of 70 kgs. The main issue in terms of assessment of obesity is whether it is what is known as exogenous, physiological or constitutional obesity caused by lifestyle factors or a pathological obesity caused by things like hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, Turner syndrome, pseudohypoparathyroidism. The most important discriminatory factor in this regards in a childhood obese child is the height of the child. So while weight is the most important thing to look at in a short child, Height is the most important thing to look at in an obese child. So therefore, if somebody has a physiological quote-unquote obesity, the child will be tall for age, while pathological obesity is associated with, again, short and plump child, typical case of growth failure and obesity. So if you look at this child, his height age is advanced. Weight age is obviously advanced much more. But this clearly means that this cannot be Cushing syndrome, pseudohypoparathyroidism or hypothyroidism. Often you would do a TSH in this setting and find TSH to be 7 or 8, which is not the cause of obesity, but the effect of obesity and leptin on the thyroid regulatory system and unnecessary treatment is initiated in this perspective. So clearly in this setting where the height age is more than the chronological age, no need to unnecessarily work up and evaluate from that perspective. What about this 12 year old boy with obesity? We see that his height is quite below the third percentile and weight is advanced. So height age is retarded while weight age is advanced. This is not the run of the mill constitutional obesity. We cannot just focus on lifestyle measures. We have to rule out causes like hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome, pseudohypoparathyroidism, Turner syndrome, and therefore evaluation is extremely important. So therefore, 
Just to summarize the overall interpretation of growth chart, it's absolutely important to focus on the weightage in a short child. Those who have a predominant effect on weight age are likely to have nutritional causes, while if the height age is equally or more affected it is an endocrine cause. While for obese children, if the height age is more compared to the chronological age, it looks like nutritional causes. While if it is less than age, we have to think of an endocrine or pathological cause. The key message is that if we really interpret our growth chart properly, we can do much more justice in far as far as clinical evaluation of a child with growth failure or growth excess is concerned and restrict the number of investigations which are required.